It's time now for 15 Minutes of Faith, practical application of God's timeless truth for today, with your host, me, Pastor Jeremy Byler of Harvest Baptist Church in Bay City, Michigan. So let's get started with 15 Minutes of Faith. Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to 15 Minutes of Faith. I'm so glad you're joining me here today as we're going to look at a story where we can learn what happens when we try and take matters into our own hands when we find ourselves swimming in a sea of sin. And we're going to look at a place where many people would know this individual as a man after God's own heart, but it's none other than King David and his sin with Bathsheba. And if you're wondering where that's at in your Bible, it's in the book of 2 Samuel, chapter number 11 is where the account begins. 2 Samuel, chapter number 11, and that's where we're going to begin as well today. And we're going to look at the sin of David and Bathsheba and how it turned into a very tragic situation, all because King David thought he could take matters into his own hands He thought he could fix a situation with his own devices, and he thought he could cover his sin without God knowing. But nonetheless, we'll take a look at what happens, because sometimes that happens to you and me. We get ourselves in a little bit of trouble, and sometimes we think, well, I made this mess. I need to fix it. There's no need to get God involved in the situation. Sometimes that's not always out of a situation of trying to hide from God, although a lot of times it is. But sometimes it's because of false guilt, uh, where we think, well, God, you don't need to bother yourself with this problem I created. No. The Bible says, cast all your care upon him, for he careth for you. When you mess up, confess it unto the Lord. Run to him and seek his guidance and wisdom to help you out of the situation. Think about it. If that were the case, think about how salvation would work. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, it's pretty interesting, as many people do try to earn their way into heaven. But as the Bible says, there is none righteous, no, not one. So as we try to cover our sinful situation with our own actions, it's no different than trying to earn our own salvation, which neither are going to work. So let's take a look at some principles we can learn from the account of David and Bathsheba. What we see here in 2 Samuel chapter number 11, verse number 1, it says, And it came to pass... After the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabah. But David tarried at Jerusalem. Already we see the slightest compromise, as we learned in another episode in regards to Lot, a very small compromise is the gateway to this great disaster. David wasn't where he was supposed to be. Did you catch that in verse number one? When the time came when kings went forth to battle. David's the king. Now this would be a time of year. It'd be springtime. Uh, The ground in the springtime maybe isn't as uh, slippery or as muddy or as mucky. It's more of a good condition to move armies and chariots and horses and position them for battle. So it's that time of year where they are supposed to go. And David uh, gathers his army together and sends Joab and the rest. But we see here that David tarried at Jerusalem. He was not where he was supposed to be. He was sticking around back at the palace, uh, yeah, back at the kingdom, um, all by himself, so to speak. I mean, he had his servants there and everybody else that was not involved with the army. But nonetheless, he sent them off to go to battle. He wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. And then we see in verse number two what happens because of that. It says, And it came to pass in an even evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. Now we can take a look at all these things, and we know that David had it set in his heart that he was going to stay back from the time of battle. And he did just that, and we know that he was laying in bed all day, just not doing what he was supposed to be doing, not being busy about his father's business. And it led to that idle time, And he rose up, as we saw, in the evening tide. In the evening, and he goes up on top of the roof, which is a very common thing to do in those days. Uh, That was a place you could go on on the rooftop of your house. And wouldn't you know it, uh, he saw a young lady, Bathsheba, bathing, which was also customary and common to do, also 
in the evening tide, which kind of makes you wonder uh, if that was not intentional. But we're not necessarily looking at motive today. We're just looking at actions and their consequences. So he sees that she is bathing, and in verse number three it says, And David sent and inquired after the woman and said, Is not this Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? David ignored wise counsel. One of his servants was wise enough and brave enough to speak up to the king, saying, Why are you seeking after this young lady? Isn't she the daughter of Eliam? Isn't she the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Really what he's saying is, David, isn't she off limits? But David disregards this, and we see what happens. It says, And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned to her house. So they went and sent for her. She came unto David's house. They had partaken in the physical act of fornication, really, or adultery is what it was, um, and he sent her on her way. And then we see in verse number five that the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. Now we understand that there is a passage of time between uh, verses four and five. It's not as though that uh, they uh, partook in the act, he sent her home, and then instantly she knew. And uh, no, that was not the case. Some time passed, and then she came back to David and let him know the news that she was pregnant. So David knew that he had a situation on his hands that he needed to take care of. So what he does, instead of confessing it unto the Lord, instead of going to God and confessing his sin, instead of saying, you know, how can we make this right? He says, no, I am the king. I have power. I am in control. I will figure out what to do. So what he does, it says in verse number six, and David sent to Joab saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And what takes place is we see uh, numerous attempts of David to cover up his sin. The first thing he does is invites Uriah home off the battlefield, and he says, Uriah, since you're home at my request, why don't you go spend the night with your wife? But Uriah was such a faithful warrior, such a faithful soldier to the Lord's army, that he could not bring himself as his uh, companions, his fellow uh, members of the army were out there doing battle. He says, I cannot go to my wife, and he, he stayed by the palace, and he stayed at the footstep of the palace, and this is not going according to David's plan. His, his desire was that he would spend the night with his wife, and then they would believe that the baby belonged to the two of them. So instead, David says, you know what? We're going to do something different. The second time, second night, he says, you know, go ahead, drink, be merry, and he gets him drunk. So not only do we see uh, the sin of lying, the sin of conspiracy, of trying to cover something up, and now he's forcing Uriah to partake in the sin of drunkenness. And he hopes that as he gets drunk, he'll want to go be with his wife, go spend the night, and then all this thing will be water under the bridge. But he does not do that. He sleeps at the steps of the king's house as a faithful and loyal soldier. So nonetheless, David has no other recourse, so he thinks. So he thinks. You know, he has Uriah there with him. He could have confessed it to Uriah, confessed it to the Lord, and Yes, it would have been a painful situation. Yes, it would have been ugly. Yes, there would have been ramifications, but not like the ramifications we see here. As then finally, as we see here unto verse number 14, it says, And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. Pretty much what he was saying was take him to the fiercest battle, set him up front, and when he gets up front, everyone else retreat and let him be overtaken. And that is exactly what happened. And Uriah died, and he died in battle. And for Uriah's perspective, he died valiantly, although be it unnecessarily, because David was trying to cover sin. And we see here, that God was definitely not pleased with the situation. As we see in 2 Samuel 11, verse 27, it says, And when the morning was past, that was the morning of the death of Uriah, said David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. So what the Lord does is he sends a prophet by the name of Nathan. And Nathan tells him a story, or we would call it a parable. And he poses the parable in the phrase of a question, 
and asking King David, what would you do in this situation? And in 2 Samuel chapter 12, the parable is this, starting in verse 2. It says, The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had brought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his own bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And then we see David's response to this parable. In his valiancy, we see, he says, And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. David said, How dare anyone do this in this situation? Whoever has done this shall be put to death. And then he also says, furthermore, in verse 6, he says, And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. And then we see the response. The rubber meets the road. The truth hits the wall here in verse number 7 where it says, And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. What God says through Nathan the prophet to David, he says, what are you doing taking matters into your own hand, taking that which you believe belongs to you when it doesn't, when you could simply inquire of me of many things? And I have I not provided for you uh, so many things through the kingship and through my graciousness and my goodness. And he calls out David, calls him out onto the carpet. And we see that David's sin had come to fruition. Obviously, the many things that had happened, but we know that God sees all things. And he saw the sin of David. The Bible says, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. So by the grace of God, really it is that David got caught. I also work in addictions counseling uh, through different ministries that help those that are suffering or struggling with addictions, trying to overcome them and see victory. And sometimes they are there uh, through court appointment. And one of the things I tell them when they're in our, involved in our addictions ministry through court appointment, I say, I'll tell you this, you're the lucky one because you got caught. And you have a chance to have victory. Some continue in their sin and get so caught in the depths of their sin uh, that there's really no way out. And the only recourse is death. And they have no more chance to confess, to get things right, to find salvation through Christ and victory in Jesus through his sanctification. And that's where we're going to stop today. But here's some things we're going to learn uh, thus far as we look at the account of David and Bathsheba. And we'll continue next time, uh, continuing to learn to see David's response and the way we can respond when we are caught up in our sin and we bring it before the Lord. So here are four takeaways from our time today in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. Number one, stay about your father's business. When we stray, we pay. Be about your father's business and be doing what God wants you to do. Number two, if you look for sin, you'll find it. David hung around, David got lazy, David found sin. Number three, sin has devastating consequences, not just for you, but for those around you. Not only did Uriah die, but later on in 2 Samuel, we learned that the child that was conceived between David and Bathsheba died also. There was much mourning and much death because of sin. Sin has devastating consequences for you and for those around you. Then finally, number four, don't cover up. Confess. Don't spend your time trying to cover up that sin that God sees anyway. So we'll continue looking at the proper response to sin when we realize the sin that we're in. There's always a way of escape. And we'll continue next time looking at David's response, uh, David's repentance, and that's something that we can do as well. So I want you to spend some time in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. Read it and kind of put yourself in the situation and think about how you would respond when the time comes that you are the man or the woman that is involved in some sin. Praise the Lord, we have a gracious God that will forgive. The Bible says if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So think about that and come back next time as we continue. But in the meantime, I would encourage you 
to stay faithful.